What a wonderful day to come to God's house. We are a blessed people, whether we know it or not. God blesses us so much. I believe today that we live far beneath the blessings that God has for us. Blesses us in ways that we do not understand, that we do not even realize. Praise His name. Small group meets tomorrow evening, Bible study Wednesday night. Things that we have coming up, Saturday, May the 7th at 10 o'clock, be a Mother's Day brunch. So we invite ladies to come and be a part of that. Uh, Sunday, June the 5th will be our 78th anniversary celebration. Well, those are things that are coming up that we will be talking more about as we get a little bit closer to them. It's good to be in God's house. We're glad you're here today. A day in Sunday school. We had everybody except one person who is a normal attender was in Sunday school this morning. Praise his name. We had 43 in Sunday school this morning. That's the most we've had in Sunday school in a long time. We ask you to be faithful. I promise if you're faithful, God will be faithful to you. That's not a guess. That's not a hope. That is a promise. I stand before you this morning to tell you that I love the Lord. Amen. And I know for a fact and beyond a shadow of doubt today that He loves me. I knelt at an altar October the 15th, 1972, and asked Him to come into my heart. That's a date I will never forget. There are dates that I better not forget. Once my wife's birthday and our anniversary, if I forget them, I'm in deep trouble. But October the 15th, 1972 is a date that is imprinted in my life. That was a long time ago, Gary. I was a lot younger back at that point in my life. God has been so good to me. And bless me so abundantly. Amen. I am not alone in that. You are a part of God's family. You are part of God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And it's because of him that you are even allowed to be here this morning. Mm -hmm. His blessings upon your life. Mm -hmm. Praise his wonderful name. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence this morning. Lord, we just pause to tell you that we love you. And we thank you this morning, Lord, for your many blessings upon our lives. And as we come together this morning, Lord, in your name, I pray that your spirit might come. Touch each heart and each life that is present. Bless in everything that we say and do, that it might lift up. Praise and glorify the wonderful name of Jesus. Blessing this service in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
this time, I'd like to call for Clara's family to come forward, please. I'd like to read a few words about Miss Clara. Clara Herndon was born April the 4th, 1933, to Arthur and Lily Hill in Linden, Texas. She was one of 14 children. She was raised on Round Mountain in Conway, Arkansas, through most of her childhood years. She was a mother to eight children, a dedicated mother who sacrificed everything for her children. She raised these children by, her child, by herself, praying they would all follow in her footsteps at putting Christ first in their lives. She was a strong, independent, unselfish woman who always put herself last. She never wanted her children to know how she struggled to raise them properly. She was preceded in death by her parents, several siblings, and two sons. She leaves to treasure so many wonderful memories, four sisters, six children, many grandchildren, and even more great-grandchildren, and one great-great-grandchild, along with many more family members and dear friends, to which we would all say yes. If she were here speaking to you today, she would want you to know that all of you were important to her, and she loved you each one. She would also want you to know that she will see you again in heaven. She was a special lady that will always hold a special place in so many hearts. And I have some very special memories of this sweet lady. She was in my Sunday school class for several years. And I will always remember Pat, her coming in my classroom every Sunday morning with a big hug. I miss those hugs so much. She was a very special lady. And if you all would come forward, I have a plaque that I would like to read to you at this time as I present it to you, which reads, If to die is to see with clear vision all mysteries revealed, and away is swept the curtain from joys which are now concealed, if to die is to greet all the martyrs and prophets and sages of old, and to joyously meet by still waters the flock of our own little fold, if to die is to join in hosannas to a risen, reigning Lord, and to feast with him at his table on the bread and wine of his board. If to die is to enter a city and be hailed as a child of its king, O grave, where soundeth thy triumph? O death, where hideth thy sting? This certificate is presented in memory of Clara Lavon <coughs> Herndon, whose name has been placed on the memorial roll, Nazarene Missions International. That's a quote from your church
impossible. All things are possible with God. Nothing is, is impossible with Him. Sunday, Lord, we say we're a needy people, and we are. It is so good to see Shirley here again, and we just continue to lift her up and pray that you just touch her and pray, Lord, that all these treatments are going to help. We pray for Cynthia that's going through chemo treatments herself, and we just lift her up and pray that you touch her. And Father, we think of uh, Kathy Blue that's been having such a battle with these migraines, and we just pray in a special way that you would touch her and be close to her in a special way. And then, Lord, we thank Pat Barton. We pray that you continue to touch her with these problems that she's facing. And then we lift Leslie Curtis up to you. They think she's had a stroke this morning. And we just lift Leslie up and pray, God, that you'd be with the doctors and give them special guidance and wisdom as to what they need to do. We thank the Lord of Bonnie. Norma, Maggie, these three ladies are dealing with some issues, and we just pray that you touch them in a special way. We thank Father of Carol Yarberry, blind in one eye, just having all kinds of problems. And then we lift up Kenneth to you and pray, Lord, that you just touch him with some of the health issues that he's facing. Touch him in a special way and be close to him. And Father, we thank of Greg's uncle that's still recovering from a fall. Pray that you bless him. And Lord, uh, I know that there are people here in our congregation that are dealing with some issues right now that are really hard for them. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just work it all out because there's nothing that's too difficult for you. We're reminded that Jesus said, is there anything too hard for God? No. So we take all these things that seem to be hard to us, to you. Pray that you work out some miracles. We continue to lift up Sam's sister to you and pray that you just touch her in a special way. And I pray for Ken Chetwood that's having some health issues today. I pray that you just touch him. I know that uh, you can do all things. Teresa and Faith are dealing with fibromyalgia pain. And we just pray for them that you touch them in a special way. And then, Lord, I pray especially today it was a tough day for Clarence's family. What a special lady she was. And we just pray that you bless the family and be close to them. And let them sense your presence. And let them know that you love them. And how neat it is for us to know that Clara is no longer confined to a hospital bed. No special medicine or doctor. She's running around. No glasses. She's got a brand new body. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege we've had to know Clara and be a part of her life. Father, we do pray for our country as 
we say every week, if ever there was a day we need to lift up America, it's today. And we do pray that you'd just lift our country up. Bless it, Lord, and I pray that you'd give our leaders wisdom, starting with our president, vice president, our congress, our state, county, and city leaders. We pray for the Church of the Nazarene, Lord, the six general superintendents we have, our missionaries across the world, our own district leadership, Brother Russ and Gail, we pray that you just bless them. Father, we pray especially now for each one of the congregation that's got some needs. Lord, you know what they are. And we just pray in a special way that you just settle in upon them. Touch them. Undertake for them to meet every single need that's going on in their lives as only you can do. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. And Father, as we pray each Sunday now, we ask that you'd walk around the altar and up and down each pew. And would you give each one of us that big daddy's hug that we need. And we'll be careful to give you the honor and the praise and the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. This song is like me. It's all over. But I like it. It's got a line in it. It's got a line in the song that says, I wonder what I could have done to preserve God's only son. Not much. Just be here. That's all I did. And he loved me. I'm kind of glad. Thank you. 
stand for uh, the reading of God's holy word. Today's text is taken from Proverbs 14, 9 through 19. Fools mock at making amends for sin, but goodwill is found among the upright. Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share the joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will be flourished. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Even, though, even in laughter the heart may ache and rejoicing may end in grief. The faithfulness will be fully repaid but for their ways, and the good rewarded for their for theirs. The simple believe anything but the prudent give thought to the steps. The wise fear the Lord and shun evil, but a fool is uh, hard-headed and yet feels secure. The wise fear the Lord and shun evil, but a fool is the same one again, hot-headed and yet feels insecure. A quick-tempered person does foolish things and the one who devises evil scheme is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the principle, the prudent, are crowned with knowledge. Evil doers will bow down before in the presence of the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. Bow our head for a word of prayer. Oh God, on this Sunday morning you've given us to come and pray and worship you. As we read the words of your holy words and we know what it tells us about how we should live our lives, help us to look at Jesus Christ as our example. And right and work and walk in the righteousness that he would have us right walk, walk in today. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ and for his praise and for his glory. Amen. Amen. When Roy B. Mott was the chaplain of the Payne College in Georgia, he preached the shortest sermon in the history of that college. However, he had a rather long topic. Here was the topic. What does Christ answer when we ask, Lord, what's in religion for me? The complete content of his sermon was one word. Nothing. Nothing. He later explained that that one word sermon was meant for people that were brought up with the gimme gimme gospel. When asked how long it took him to prepare the message, he said, 20 years. 20 years. Well, let me share some thoughts with you about the way it seems. If you'd like to fill in the blanks, we'll be it in just a second. But you know, we say things just aren't always the way they seem or appearances are deceiving. But if you look at today's world, you will certainly form some pretty strange impressions, won't you? Things that are going on today. I want to look at some of these impressions and the realities that are behind them. And here we go with the blanks. If you'd like to fill in the blanks, number one, the first one is it doesn't matter how you live. It does not matter how you live. Well, the current philosophy in the world tells us that there is a division between life and belief. You know, lifestyle and belief tend to be unrelated even for the Christian. For example, we know that God has rules such as the Ten Commandments. And you also know as parents that we have had rules, haven't we? One of the rules that you may have had like I had with mine and my children is this. Do not lie to me. Because if you lie to me, I'm going to find out that you lied and you're going to get punished for breaking the rule. And then you're going to get punished for lying to me. And so I was making my point very clear. I don't like liars. And they understood that real well. But then what happens to us? The phone rings next day or so and your child answers the phone and says, who is it? Well, they mention that name and you're like, and we say something like this, tell them I'm not here. Tell them I'm not here. Well, 
more often than not, the child may not call you on that, but he's just heard us lie, hasn't he? Yeah. He just heard us lie. So we're teaching him double standards. So the philosophy seems to be, don't do what I do, do what I say. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Don't do what I do, do what I say. You know, back in the mid-80s, Sunday school in the Church of Nazarene was devalued. And what happened, kids came to Sunday school, the reason they were here is their parents would drop them off and they didn't go out for brunch. And so they were giving a very clear message to their children that Sunday school is for kids. And so what would happen when the kids became adults, not only did they stop coming to Sunday school, they stopped coming to church. And you know what we parents said? Well, why did God let this happen? Really? Well, what's the biblical teaching on this? Well, there's a specific connection between life and belief. Our outward conduct shows our inward feeling. Once upon a time, there was a woman who woke up in the morning, went to the mirror in the bathroom and looked, and saw that she had three hairs on top of her head. And she said, oh, well, I think today I will braid my hair. So she did. She had a wonderful day. Well, the next morning she woke up, looked in front of the mirror, and she saw she had two hairs. And she said, oh, well, I think I will part my hair in the middle today. <laughs> so she did, and she had a wonderful day. Well, the next day she looked in the mirror, and she saw she had only one hair. And she said, well, I guess I'll wear my hair in a ponytail today. <laughs> so she did, and she had a wonderful day. The next day, she looked in the mirror and she discovered she had no hairs on top of her head at all. And she said, hooray, I don't have to do anything with my hair today. <laughs> That's a good outlook on life, isn't it? Most of us wouldn't have that outlook, would we? We'd kind of be starting to complain and gripe. And then I heard about the pastor that uh, went to one of his deacons and he said, hey deacon, there was a mule that dropped dead right in front of the church today. And the deacon looked at him and he said, why are you coming to me with that? He said, you preachers are supposed to bury the dead, aren't you? And the preacher said, well, yeah, that's true, but we always notify the next of kin. <laughs> Our conduct shows the way in which we regard God, doesn't it? So we see that a man is evil because he has cast off his fear of the Lord. You know, isn't it amazing how often we think about what can God do for us, but we seldom think about what God can do to us. You ever think about that? Yeah. Folks, if your belief doesn't change your life, then there's something wrong with your belief, isn't there? Here's the second one. Another thing that uh, people think, sin is funny. Sin is funny. Well, here's the current philosophy of the world. We commit sin lightly. In other words, it's no big deal. Nobody cares. And we give light names to serious transgressions, such as alcoholism. Well, alcoholism is really not a big deal. It's not a sin, it's a sickness. And everybody gets sick, so nobody's responsible for it, really. And then if we have a Christian family member or a friend that comes to us and tries to rebuke us for it, we make a joke over it, don't we? It's not a big deal. Don't be so hard. You know, folks, I've found over the years that a lot of humor is based on sin. A lot of humor is based on sin. When we were, I was 21, Faith was younger, we were stationed at Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. 9,000 miles away from Columbus, Ohio, by air. And when you get that far away from family and home and your home church, it, it's kind of lonely sometimes. In fact, when I first got there, they didn't even have a church of the Nazarene. Well, when Faith got there, they had one that wasn't officially organized. And so we just felt like, man, we're back at home going to the church of the Nazarene. And there was one fellow there that was just the epitome of what a Christian man should be. I mean, I just looked up to him so much. He was probably mid to late 30s. He was a master sergeant in the Air Force, and he was my friend. I mean, he looked out for me. He helped me. He mentored me. And then one Saturday, we had a work day at the church. 
and I won't call this guy's name because I'm never going to, he may be listening sometime, you never know, but he said this. He said, guys, come here, let me tell you one. And he told a crude, vulgar joke. And it just blew me, blew me away. I mean, here was this guy that was the epitome of what a Christian example was. And while he didn't cuss, it wasn't something that I thought a 21-year-old that was good to say in front of other Christian men. And something changed that day with my relationship to him. He was no longer the Christian mentor that he had been. Oh, he was still my friend. He still cared for me. He still looked out and helped me a lot. But something had changed. Let me tell you something. I want you to understand this. You who profess to be a Christian, you will influence somebody Amen. for good or for bad. Because there's people watching you. There's people always watching what you say and what you do. Well, what's the biblical saying or teaching? Yes, sin is funny, but only a fool laughs at it. But sad to say there's a reversal here because sin mocks fools. Have you ever noticed that if you yield to temptation and you actually sin, and you think, well, and Satan says, well, nobody's going to find out. It'll be cool. It'll be fun. After you do it, he leads the cheer against you. Have you ever noticed that? He has a way of making you feel like such a big dummy. Why did you do that? Because it doesn't seem as glamorous as it was the way he described it was going to be. <coughs> he leads it. He mocks you. And then when you think about a sinner that's trying to make a big, powerful prayer, he's a fool. A sinner trying to pray big and powerful prayers is a fool because we know that God doesn't listen to sinners, the scripture says. He listens only to the godly people who do his will. And God is pleased with righteous, not with sin. He's pleased with righteousness, not with sin. And here's a third one. Happiness is found in doing your own thing. You ever heard that? Here's the current philosophy. Restraint is the cause for happiness. Unhappiness. Restraint is the cause for unhappiness. And it's only when you have complete freedom that leads to happiness for you. In other words, if it feels good, do it. Have you heard that? After all, nobody's going to get hurt. Are these sayings familiar to, it, to you? Have it your way. Yeah. You deserve a break today. <laughs> yeah. What's the biblical teaching? It's real simple. The determination to do one's own thing demonstrates a backslidden spirit. When you're going to do it your way no matter what, regardless of what God thinks or says, it's backslidden spirit. And we reap the fruit that we sow, don't we? Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. And the good man is filled with the fruits of his own life. And then a fourth thing, hard work is not worth it. The current philosophy in the world is, don't sweat it. It's not a big deal. And nobody gives eight hours, honest worth of eight hours a day to an employer anymore, do you? Nobody does that. Nobody does that. Why do it? Don't work too hard. Have you ever told him about that? Yeah. <laughs> Don't work too hard. You ever stop thinking what that means? No, we don't. I don't think we really mean it that way, but it's just one of those kind of flippant phrases that come out of our mouth before we think about it. Mm -hmm. Don't work too hard. I don't know about you, and probably you're just like me. My dad taught me when I go to work for somebody, it's important that I give him eight hours of work for eight hours of pay. And that's just what he pounded me with. And if I would ever slip that I wouldn't do it part of my job, not only if my boss found out that I get a lecture from him, I got a lecture from my dad too, that I had let him down. I let my boss down. And then he said, the thing was really bad, really low. He said, you let God down. But he's right. He's right. Yeah. Another one they say, if it's too hard, don't worry about it. Just don't do it. It'll wait on you. You ever, you ever heard anyone say that to you? Oh, don't worry about it. It'll wait on you. Now, that is true to a degree. Sometimes we make, we set things up for ourselves to do. If you're, if you have a little bit of melancholy and you're a planner, 
uh, one of the things that, that I've got in my office, I've got some sheets that where you can plan your whole day what you're going to do. Well, I don't use the sheets anymore. I use it up here. And I pretty well have my day planned before I ever get to the office. I know what I'm going to do. One, two, three, four, five, six. But the problem is, I don't always get it all done because of people. Somebody may come to the door, somebody may call me, and I may get an email, you need to do this for one of your students or what have you. And so I said, well, that's not a problem because at the end of the day, I'll just move that to the top of the list for tomorrow and I'll do it tomorrow. But you know something else I found out? If I didn't get it done that first day, maybe it wasn't as important as I thought. So again, that's where God kind of gives us a brain, wants us to use it, to think it through. The biblical teaching about that is this, though. All honest industry has a reward. Did you know the work was present before the fall? Adam was charged to take care of the garden. And the language of action is more eloquent than the language of words. Have you ever been around somebody that had a wonderful talk about what we're going to do? But then when it came time to do the talk, Put it into action, make it walk. They didn't do it. They weren't there. Here's another one. Say what you think. Nobody cares. It's okay. The current philosophy is this. How spoken this is a virtue. Have you ever heard this? The squeaky wheel gets the oil. Yeah. If you've been around me much, you've heard that a lot. Some people say, well, it's best to say all that you think. Don't hold anything back. Just let it all out. The proverb says this, a person telling his entire mind is revealing his total folly. A wise man doesn't blurt out all that he knows, in other words. Now, the biblical teaching on that is this, anger withdraws the light of understanding. He who is short in temper is a mighty fool. Or another way of saying that is, it's better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I heard that a lot from my dad. <laughs> he put his arm on my shoulder and say that to me. Look me right in the face and never smile. Say, thanks, Dad. I needed that today. In other words, Solomon is saying a wise man doesn't blurt out all that he knows or thinks he knows. A sixth thing, there are many ways to please God. You know, I ran up to the post, drove up to the post office Friday night. You know, we do our taxes quarterly, so I went, I'm going to get these in the mail. So I took them to the post office, and I went down to Candace past this new Muslim church. They were having services. Do you know I did not see a single parking space open completely full? They had a security guy out there drifting traffic even. There are many ways to make it to him and to God. That's the world's philosophy. So, first of all, postpone any serious considerations about heaven. Don't be such a hard head. You've got plenty of time. You know, if, if, if you find that you made a mistake when you get old, like the preacher, then you can get serious about getting things ready then. But don't worry about it because we're all doing the same thing. You know, most of us think we're pretty good people, don't we? It's kind of like the story about a bunch of warthogs. You know what a warthog looks like? I'm not exactly going to win any Academy Awards for their looks, are they? These warthogs were all together, and they were in a big argument over which one of them was the best looking. Now, if you and I were there, and we understood their language, look at them and say, it doesn't matter which one of you are the best looking. You're all ugly. Right? And in the same way, if we compare ourselves to somebody else, in God's eyes, we're all sinners. But as Christians, we're saved by grace. So we're not, none of us are any better than the other. But you know, we have a tendency to judge the end of the road by its beginning, don't we? The biblical teaching. There is a warning against following unexpected conscience. We need to be informed by God's word. The most important thing that we don't do is read his word. I don't know why we don't, but we just don't. Why? Because it's hard work. 
Why? Because we have someone that wants to read God's Word. We have someone that wants to pray. We have someone that wants to come to church. His name is Satan. Wednesday night, someone said, was his name capitalized? I don't care. It's the name of a person who plays for things, so I capitalize it. But you know when Donna was here, she said, I'm not going to capitalize that name. So that's fine. Yeah. That's okay. However you want to do it, he is a being that exists. He's the name of a person who plays for things. And he was a cherub. And he was thrown out of heaven because of pride. And his goal is to hurt God. You say, well, say, you can't hurt God. Well, yeah, I can. He hurts God by hurting you, God's children. And so he does his very best to come after us. So following a false light will always lead us astray. If it seems right, you know, so many times men go along assuming that they're all right, but in reality, they're in left field. And they really don't have a clue. Man makes the judgment, but sometimes we forget that man is not the final judge. We do it either God's way or we're going to die. The wages of sin is death. Fear and simple. You know, our society today is so messed up that we can almost teach that if our society teaches that it's okay, it's not. Isn't that right? The Bible counteracts all of this and it gives you something to go by. Here's what Proverbs 1 says. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. I think that's what's happening in America today. You know? It's because it's, it's, because it's really not a head knowledge, it's a heart knowledge problem, isn't it? The heart knowledge. I heard this story about this fellow. He really didn't like to go to the convenience store, but... It was, well, it was convenient, and so he went. When he had a craving for a light, late night snack, he went to the convenience store to get something because that was the only thing that was open. At 3.30 in the morning when his baby girl had a toothache, he went to the convenience store because that was the only place that was open that had any medicine. He bought some sealant for a flat tire one time because that was the only thing that was open. He even bought some gas at this convenience store because he didn't want to go across town. And then one day when he was late for work, he stopped and brought a sausage biscuit, a rose and a figurine when he forgot about his wife's anniversary. Bad thing to do, guys. <laughs> Don't forget it. But even though he really didn't like this convenience store, he found himself drawn there time after time after time. So whether it was a medical need, a quick fix for his hunger, or just something that wasn't available anywhere else, the man came to rely on that convenience store. And when he had nowhere else to turn, when he had a need that no one else could meet, there was always the convenience store, and that's where he went. Well, one night another need arose, and it was late at night. He quickly got out of bed, got dressed, got in his car, and drove to the convenience store. But he noticed there were no cars there, and it was dark, and he couldn't figure it out. It had always been open. He got out and he noticed that there was a note on the door. And here's what this note said. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot solve. Neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. Folks. God doesn't like being treated like a convenience store. Did you know that? Prayer isn't something we fall back when there's nothing else we can do. He doesn't like for his children to only come around when there's an emergency or a need. He longs for us to spend some time with him on a daily basis through reading his word, through talking with him, through spending that time with him. He wants us to come when there's not a situation where there's no place else to turn. But when we do that, we have to realize that some days the doors are closed, the lights are turned out, there's no cars there. And sometimes he stops listening to our prayers because sin has separated you from him. If your prayers are seeming kind of cold and dark, if your petitions
persecution seem to be locked out and you're unable to enter the store of heaven, if the things that you ask for seem that you can't find them anywhere, there's some good news because there was another note, the bottom of the note, and this that was on the door. Here's what it said. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will heal their land, and now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. I was thinking this morning of how neat God is. You know, if someone, if someone really messes with me, someone one time was giving me a hard time in one of my classes, and I just looked at him like, really? I said, Brother Steve, I'm just messing with you. You ever had anybody mess with you? Sometimes I don't like people to mess with me. Especially when they're trying to be serious. I, you know, or when I'm trying to be serious. I don't like that. But if you're going through a tough time, realize that God loves you in spite of yourself. And I was thinking this morning, there's lots of times that I'm messing with him, but yet he still loves me for some reason. He still cares about me for some reason. I tell you what, I look in the mirror sometimes, I don't. I don't love me, let alone love me. I don't even like me. But he does. And it's hard for me to grasp that. That he could love me that much when I don't love myself. But that's the kind of God that we serve. And I don't do it as often as I do, but I've got a couple journal books. I mean, you've given me some journal books in my office. And this morning I sat down after all the stuff we've done. I grabbed one of my journal books and just wrote some things to myself. And to God, I just thanked Him. Thanked Him for being God. Thanked Him for loving me in spite of who I am. And I ended up with, love you, Lord, and you are the very best underlined it. And you know, I don't understand the scriptures where, oh, I understand theologically, but as a person, I don't really understand why He wants to talk to me. I don't understand that. The, the, in the guy that's in charge of the universe is interested in me. I don't understand that, but he is. And so there's an encouragement that when I am not just down, but when things are going good, he wants to talk to me then too. But you know, we have a tendency to talk to him when things are tough. But he wants to talk to us then, but he also wants to talk to us when things are going good too and share with us. You know, that's, that's what being a father is all about. And that's what Jesus said when you pray, pray in this fashion, Abba, Father. You know, Abba translates into the word Daddy. That's what he wants to be to us, and we'll just let him. So how's your prayer life been? You know, sometimes when you get out of it, you have to kind of start all over again on rebuilding your prayers. You know, there's five different types of prayer. Confession. If you will start your prayer out with a confession. Lord, have I done anything that I shouldn't have? And then you just kind of shut up. Here's what will happen. If you had immediately, that thought will come into your mind. You blew it. And then you're reminded of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will Lord, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. And he will. And then you go into prayer number two, Thanksgiving. And I do a lot of that. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for all that you do for me. Praise. Praise him for who he is. So you thanksgiving, you're praising, and then you do the intercession. That's where you pray for other people. And the last one is the one that I find that if I do these other four, I don't spend much time with petition. That's the give me, give me, give me. If I've done these other things, I kind of realize I don't need to do that because he's going to take care of me. And you know what? He never has let me down. I told you before, Toller's got a book out. He's never let me down, but he sure has scared me to death a couple times. He will never, ever let you down. Another thing that you can do if you're having a little bit of trouble with your prayers, write them out. Now, one of the things that my dad did that was tremendous, he really pushed me to take typing in the ninth grade. And way back in ancient history, we didn't even have electric typewriters. They were manual. Some of you are like, really? What's a manual typewriter? Would you know on a computer I can type about 60 words a minute? Yeah. 
and this finger goes right to the reverse key. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thankful that, but you know, a lot of times I can pray, write my prayers, but I do it on the computer, and then save it. And then later on, especially if you've had a need or something, you can go back two, three weeks later and see that need and go, wow, I didn't even realize God took care of that. But he does. So there's all kinds of different things that you can do. But the key is to remember, he is not an uncle or a grandpa that's in a nursing home where you visit him once or twice a month. He wants us to visit him every day. Spend some time with him and love him. And I'll say this to you. <clears throat> God is good. All the time. All the time. All the time. Well, Ron is going to come and uh, read the results of our church election. And then Ron, I'll just have you close in prayer for us. The uh, church board for the upcoming church year will consist of George Bratton, me, Sam Gray, Terry Smothers, Odie Smothers, and Pat Bartman. The Sunday School Superintendent will be Faith Means. The Sunday School Board will be Melinda Carter, Sharon Gray, Terry Smothers, Odie Smothers, Pat Bartman, and Pat Williams. The NMI President, Mission President, will be Bonnie Bratton, and her Vice President will be Sharon Gray. The delegates to the uh, missions uh, convention will be Faith Comings, Sam Gray, and Sharon Gray. The Sunday school delegates to the convention will be Bonnie Bratton, Terry Smothers, and Pat Bartman. The district assembly delegates will be Sam Gray, Gary Jones, and Jeanette Jones. I know all the uh, nominations were prayerfully considered, and I uh, do indeed hope that the voting itself was prayerfully considered so that God's work can continue here at this church. Now, if we will, uh, if we will, uh, let us rise and I'll dismiss with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we ask you to open our eyes to the many, many blessings that we receive each day, to the words that Pastor Comings gives us, and, and to the words you have written in your book that we should study to show ourselves approved. Go with us now and reveal your blessings to us on a moment by moment, on a moment by moment basis. And bless us so we can come back into your house to worship you again. Amen. Amen. Amen.